to serve you. And we do trust that it will be a day of serving according to your will. In all of our ways, we do acknowledge you and trust you to lead us and guide us on the path of speaking, listening, hearing, going and returning. We thank you for this meeting. And we know that in this workshop, the Holy Spirit can do work that will avail throughout the coming year and for the rest of eternity. Stir up your praying people, Lord, and give them utterance. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hallelujah. Bless the Lord. Please be seated. Now today we're going to go along another line. And today I think you could consider this a briefing. Um, we are the army of the Lord. Pastor Mac can tell you that armies have to have briefings. I will tell you that I'm just back. We got back about midnight Thursday night from uh, uh, being gone since August 4th. And I was most of the time in Australia and then in Singapore about a week and a half. But I can tell you that the great outpouring of the Holy Ghost that was prophesied by Wigglesworth to begin in Australia has begun. Bless the Lord. I've been going there eight years after uh, an encounter with David Duplessy in which he shared with me about what would happen there as Wigglesworth prophesied it, and we saw it. We saw miracles like I've never seen before outside the church meetings in the city wherever it's an outpouring. One man had a cancer, a black cancer, that was on his face like this. Now, he was standing in faith. He knew to stand in faith. He's a Greek teacher and a professor. He is a graduate of Rhema, Perth. And he had been standing and said, I'm going to have, they were trying to get him to have it removed. He said, nope, I'm going to trust God to remove it. And uh, when hands were laid on him and not on that place, it, that thing shot across the room and people saw it shoot off that face. And it was just baby skin underneath everything. I heard about things like this, you know. And uh, uh, just marvelous. I could tell you stories after stories. Uh, but we have another purpose here. I'm just telling you that that's happening now. All kinds of things are signs to us of the shortness and lateness of the hour and the coming of the king. Hallelujah. I'm going to be so glad when he makes every wrong things right on this earth. That's what he's moving toward. Every single bit of wickedness will be moved out of here. Isn't that great, glorious? Hallelujah. Blessed be the Lamb. Um, I want to begin today with a scripture that as we talk about Bible prophecy, you absolutely have to know this scripture. It is the key to unlocking Bible prophecy. I heard this scripture spoken audib audibly to me by the Lord. I won't spend a lot of time on this because we have to talk about so many things. But you must understand this. All the Bible is to the church. All the Bible is for the church. But not all the Bible is about the church. Some of the Bible is about other people. You cannot make yourself fit in every scripture. If you do, you will have a mishmash of end time things. And I was in my kitchen, heard a tape by Brother Kenneth E. Hagin. Uh, I was preparing to do something for the word of faith, and I had put it up in my oh, shelf over my sink as I was peeling potatoes. And Brother Hagin said, Today we're going to speak on the subject of marriage and divorce. He said, Do you know why what Jesus said in the letters does not match what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 7? He, and they didn't silence. Nobody knew why. I myself thought Jesus and Paul should agree. And uh, first time I'd ever heard any such doctrines. And he said it's because they were speaking to two different groups of peoples. Jesus was speaking to Jews living under their covenant. And Paul was speaking to Christians living under the law of love. Interpreting different incidents in light of the law of love. And so he said, to rightly divide the word. And the Bible says, study to show thyself a workman approved unto God. Rightly dividing the word of truth. This is the word of truth, but it has to be rightly divided. If it can be rightly divided, it can be wrongly divided. So he took then the Ramah students to this scripture. It says, in a letter written to, for, and about the church. In 1 Corinthians 10, 32, it says, give no one offense. 
neither to the Jews nor to the Gentiles. Your Bible might say Greeks. Nor to the church of God. But a better way to say it, there are three groups of peoples listed here, is the Jews. The Hebrew word for Gentiles or goyim is, is goyim and it means nations. The Jews, the nations, and the church. Three groups of peoples. When you were, and Brother Hagin told them, a scripture can be written to an individual. It can be written to a group of people. It will tell you at the top. And when it's written to a group of people, sometimes what the Jews had, we can have through Abraham. But everything they got, you don't get. We don't get earthly Jerusalem. They get it during the millennium. We get heavenly Jerusalem. Bless the Lord. Hallelujah. Now, it says, Give no one offense, neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, or the nations, nor to the church of God. The Jews, the nations, and the church. I'm listening to this, and I hear a voice. To me, it's audible. And it says, if you will remember that verse of Scripture, it will keep your end time doctrine straight. From that, I didn't know I needed an end time doctrine. I didn't know what in the world was in my future. I didn't know all these strange things that have happened to me. But that day, my life changed in my kitchen in Collinsville. And since that time, it's helped me to walk down the road. Uh, we're all end time preachers now. If you're a preacher, you're an end time preacher because it's the end times. And this is it. You should know a little bit about it. Bless the Lord. In fact, you should know a lot about it. Now, today we're going to focus primarily in on not the Jews nor the church, but the nations. And we are in a time, I don't have time to tell you every single thing about it, but the Bible teaches it that it's true. There is a judgment of the nations coming. The nations are going to be divided into two groups. Jesus will divide them into the sheep nations and the goat nations. I know you've heard a preacher preach before, if you've been around very long, that you might have the chance of ending up in a goat pile. But no, not you will not. If you've been born again, you won't be in a goat pile. You will only go to the judgment seat of Christ. In Matthew 25, it says, there will be when he comes. Well, let's just look and see what it says. Let's get it right. Matthew 25. This is the final judgment of the nations. There are judgments along the way. But we're talking about nations as nations. United States of America, Australia, Singapore. That's a city-state, a nation. Matthew 25, verse 31. When the Son of Man shall come in His glory... And all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. This is not talking about when he comes in the rapture. This is after the seven years. This is after the battle. The last battle of this age is the battle over Jerusalem. You can read about it in Zechariah 12 and Zechariah 14. After the last battle of this age, when Jesus comes on his white horse, lands on the Mount of Olives, we're on our white horses behind him. We've been to the married supper of the Lamb. He stops the Antichrist from destroying Jerusalem. And then he gathers all around him the nations to judge them. Uh, verse 20, 31. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory and before him shall be gathered all what? Not the Jews, not the church, the nations. And he shall separate them, the nations, one from another, as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on the right hand, and there will be nations that go into the millennial age. They will have uh, longevity restored to bodies like these. They will have babies. Their children can play over the holes of snakes. They can have, the little babies can have a lion for a pet. Chip used to always wish he was born in this time. He'd like to have a lion for a pet. But you're going to be in the glorified bunch. Hallelujah. Bless the Lord. Glory be to God. <laughs> Jesus. Now, so we're talking about the nations. They will know a final judgment. This is a works judgment right here in Matthew 25. And it's how you treated his brethren, the Jews. Uh, it says based on how you treated his brethren. If you did it unto his brethren, you did it unto him. Now let's look for a reference on that to um, uh, Micah 5, 
Let's look at Micah 4, 2, and Micah 5. It's very important now because your prayers can have to do with how nations turn out. All right, let's look at Micah 4, 11. Here's a judgment of the nation scripture. Micah 4, 11. Now also many nations are gathered against thee that say, Let her be defiled and let our eye look upon Zion. But they know not the thoughts of the Lord, neither understand they his counsel. For he shall gather them as sheaves into the floor. We always love to talk about harvest. But the Bible mostly talks about harvest as a time of threshing and judgment. Yes, you do have the wheat, but also we get rid of the tares and the chaff. So he will gather them as sheaves into the floor. Verse 13, he will say, Arise and thresh. That's a, that's a uh, harvest word. O daughter of Zion, for I will make thine horn iron. I will make your hoofs brass. You shall beat in pieces many people. And I will consecrate their gain unto the Lord and their substance unto the Lord of the whole earth. Now, the, 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 uh, the harvester, the one that is the threshing machine here is Israel. How did you treat them? They're going to, you're going to be judged nations and thrashed on how you treated them. That is the, that's the cutting edge. Now, let's look at, uh, let's go on down to verse chapter 5. Now gather thyself in troops, O daughter of troops. He hath laid siege against us. They shall smite the judge of Israel with a rod upon the cheek. But thou, Bethlehem Ephrata, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel. That's our Lord. He is to be ruler in Israel. Whose goings forth have been of of old from everlasting. Therefore will he give them up until the time that she which travails has brought forth. There's been a giving up, you might say, of Zion for a time until Zion travails and then the nation is born in a day. Then the remnant of his brethren shall return unto the children of Israel. Notice that it calls our Lord the ruler in Israel and it calls the remnant that returns to Israel his brethren. Now the judgment in Matthew 25 is how did you treat these his brethren? Specifically during that seven year tribulation time, when Satan's trying to been wiped, be, be tried to have wiped them out, how did the nations treat them? Did they offer them refuge? Did they protect them? You know, during World War II when uh, uh, Hitler was trying to find all the Jews, there were righteous Gentiles everywhere that hid Jews that went to amazing lengths all over Europe, even though their nations gave up Jews sometimes to protect those Jews. There were nations that went to great lengths too. Finland is a nation that as a nation went went all out to protect the Jews. And so I believe Finland will be right there in the sheep nation place. Now, I'm not the judge. I don't get to say. But I have my uh, ideas. I'm looking for the United States to be one. I know Australia will be one. Now let's go to Joel. And we're going to talk here about the judgment of the nations and why, what is the... What is the um, the thing you really have to watch not to get in trouble if you are a nation for judgment. Chapter 3, Joel 3. Now Lucy, Lynn, and I, and Walter McKee had quite an interesting time in Israel, 1999, September, and the rabbis had been saying for years, that September the 11th, 1999 was an important day. We checked with rabbis in several groups. The man was not a rabbi that we checked with, one of the black coats, but he told us what his rabbis were saying. And when we asked, and he's not even supposed to be talking to Gentile women, but he started the conversation, so we just went right on in. And... He said, we, he, we said, what is this about September 11, 1999? He said, oh, his eyes rolled. 
our sages have been looking for this date for 400 years. We found it 400 years ago in the Holy Scriptures. And every rabbi we ask, and we've talked to several of them down through the years now, this is what they tell us is the crux of the date. It's the day that everything changes. September 11, 1999, they've been looking for it for hundreds of years. The day that everything changes, and it is known as the day that the final judgment of the nations in this age begins. And I really believe we've seen a lot of judgments and things happening since that time. We are seeing more now. Now, I do have some things to show you uh, on uh, PowerPoint. I don't have the number of this one, but I do want to start with Syria. Watch Syria because it's in the news right now. And Syria, when we were in Misgav Am, which is at the north of um, Israel, it's a kibbutz, and at the head of the kibbutz is a man who has to do with security. He's the number one uh, man on the hit list of the Hezbollah. They call him a security guru. If you watch Fox TV, you will see his brother, Mike Ginsburg, Mark Ginsburg, there a lot, our former ambassador to Morocco. But Mike Ginsburg is a New York Jew who came to Israel uh, probably 25 years ago. And uh, when we were there, he's the one that told us before 1991 what was going to happen. He told us we'd be in a war with Saddam Hussein before 1991. And every single time we've gone up there, he's told us what will happen next. So I always have to uh, tell the people on the bus, get them prepared, because they're going to hear a few expletives. Uh, their little uh, Pentecostal ears might be ruffled. <laughs> but I sure do love this man. And um, I, I tell him to be nice and cool it, and he does a good job, a pretty good job. It's just that he's the expert in Israel on all the, all the terrorist groups. And when he gets going on those terrorist groups, he gets so mad at them all over again <laughs> that a few words will slip out. And uh, I, I do have some PowerPoint pictures, but I don't have them. I, they're up there. I just can't remember the numbers to show you. But um, Mike told us the last time we were there. We said, okay, we call him a prophet now. Oh, he isn't even religious. We call him a prophet. He laughs and laughs. He said, I'm not a prophet. And then he says, but. <laughs> and the last time we were there, we have some, uh, Lucy was there. Uh, he said to us, there are weapons of mass destruction. The United States was not wrong about it. He said, we know where they are. We watched them. They, you took so long in coming to the war that um, they had time to bring them into Syria. And they brought them into Syria, and he said they buried them in the Bekaa Valley. Now he says, no, some of them, we watched them, and they've got surveillance equipment, plus they have men on the ground. He said some of them are no bigger than this, a canister this big that could wipe out New York City. And he said they're not so easy to find. But he said, your country won't let that stay like that, especially if Syria starts doing anything. So, recently, uh, now I'm just back from Singapore, and you don't get the very, you don't get Fox News over there, you get something called CNN World, which is, if this CNN is next to nothing, that's next to double nothing. <laughs> it's the truth. And it's so swayed against Israel. But you can kind of, you know, you have to pick out and watch and, and see what's happening. And so we did see that a man, I don't know who he was, was addressing the Senate and the Congress. And he was telling them, we've got to do something about Syria because they've opened the back door. And they are letting come across that uh, desert into uh, Iraq. They are letting Al-Qaeda operatives... Uh, you know, they're kind of making like an Afghanistan war where all the people are coming from everywhere and they're going over the back border. And then he even did mention the weapons of mass destruction. So if they're going over that back border and if they even think about digging up any of those little vials and canisters and bringing them into our troops. Now, keep those troops covered with the blood of Jesus. <laughs> keep those people covered with the blood of Jesus because somebody might try such a trick 
And if they did try trust such a trick, there would be an esca- Mike said to us there will be war in the region in four months over these things. So uh, I want you to look just at, uh, turn to Zechariah chapter 9. All right, this is David Barron's book. You know that I've spoken to you many times from David Barron. David Barron is a man who was born in 1855 in Russia, trained in the best rabbinical schools. His knowledge of the Bible is wonderful. And then he found the Lord to be the Messiah. And so his his writings are just amazing. Now the book of Zechariah, after I read his book on it, I knew I'd never read the book before. And he, uh, have you read it, Bob? (laughs) And the first eight visions are visions that uh, uh, Zechariah had in one night with short spaces between them. Absolutely marvelous. And they had to do what God did with the book of Zechariah. He started where Israel was then. They were coming back to build the second temple. He took them from where they were, God did prophetically, from where they were right down to when Jesus returns and puts his feet, the Messiah comes and puts his feet on the Mount of Olives. And then when he... uh, opens up the millennial age to the Jews. And the Jews will be the rulers on the earth during the millennial age. Uh, The nations will have to come up to them to get the word of God. Now, the the last part of the book of Zechariah begins in chapter 9. And we shall read what it says here. The burden of the word of Jehovah in the land of Hadrach, and Damascus shall be the rest thereof, when the eyes of man, as of all the tribes of Israel, shall be toward the Lord. And he says this concerning the last part. I'm reading to you from his book. The overthrow of world power and the establishment of Messiah's kingdom may be given as the epitome of the last chapters of Zechariah. Two oracles make up the whole of the second half of the book. Both sections treat of war between the heathen world and Israel, though in different ways. In the first part, chapters 9 through 11, the judgment through which Gentile world power over Israel is finally destroyed, and Israel is endowed with strength to overcome all their enemies. In the second half, chapters 12 through 14, the judgment through which Israel itself is sifted and purged in the final great conflict with the nations and transformed into the holy nation of Jehovah forms the leading topic. Now, as this has to do with Damascus and Hadrach, and Damascus shall be the resting place. That is, the judgment, which is the burden of this prophecy, shall first of all have Damascus as its goal. From that center, it shall spread itself over the whole district. This is to be understood as the lighting down of God's wrath, which shall there rest until it has accomplished His purpose. So we see that there is a certain something out of judgment of the nations that will rest and begin in Damascus. And then you see that all the eyes of man, whenever this starts, I believe God's going to start showing himself strong. I don't believe we have enough tracks to reach the Muslim world, enough TV programs, but I can tell you Jehovah can win a few supernatural wars and those Muslims will change gods in an instant because they always believe that the strong God wins. And if you'll read Ezekiel 38 and 39 about Russia coming down from the north, many times he says, I'm doing this so that the nations round about me can see Jehovah's God. And there he wins that war with giant hailstones. 
and supernatural things. You won't get mixed up on that. I heard someone the other day said that somebody had preached that those hailstones were really rockets and things. No, they're not their hailstones. He has a great big old place that is called the treasury of the hail. And no Muslim countries are going to think that anybody did it but man's power if it's rockets. They're hailstones. And then they know that God did it. And the Bible says then they'll turn. And he did it for that reason. He's going to show himself. I do not believe for one New York second that there's more people in hell than there are in heaven. If they are, the devil wins. So you can just imagine God's going to be showing himself out. Bless the Lord. Hallelujah. Bless the Lord. And the judgment has to do it. The Bible says there are things he can do in judgment that he cannot do in mercy. Bless the Lord. I think that's Isaiah 25, but I'm not for sure. Help me out, Lynn, if I don't know it or Lucy. Is that it? Yep, yep. Isaiah 26, 9. But don't lose Zechariah because he's hard to find. <laughs> Isaiah 26, 9. End of the verse. When thy judgments are in the earth, the inhabitants of the world will learn righteousness. Now that's a proof scripture. God can do... Now this is a note at the bottom I've got from somewhere and I forgot to put who... I think it was Baron. God can do things in judgment He cannot do in mercy. And an example and proof of it is the Jews with idolatry. He told them, told them, told them, don't go after idols. They did it anyway. They went into Babylonian captivity and they've never had trouble with idols since. So he did something with judgment with them that he did not, was unable to do with mercy. So we're now coming to this time. And if you'll look here in, it says, um, chapter 9, verse 1, the end of the verse. When the eyes of man, as of all the tribes of Israel, shall be toward the Lord. Now turn to Isaiah 17, 7 and 8. And Isaiah 17 is um, a scripture which has to do with the destruction of Damascus. It's never happened in all of history. Damascus is one of the longest surviving cities in earth. But this says, chapter 17, The burden of Damascus, behold, Damascus is taken away from being a city, and it shall be a ruinous heap. Now it is tied into Zechariah 9 right here at verse 7. At that day shall a man look to his maker, and his eyes shall have respect to the Holy One of Israel. God's going to get the attention of the world. And he shall not look to the altars and works of his hands. Without going into it, you can read verses 12 through 14. And this is tied into Ezekiel 38 and 39. So, very interesting. Bless the Lord. So we're going to be watching Syria, watching the happenings. When we watch, uh, oh, I tell you, this is so neat. I just came from, um, I just came from uh, Australia. And when God, oh, that Australia, you should... Maybe I did a I did a heritage Australian heritage meeting with Cole Stringer, and there those tapes are available. You can go online and get them. And I'm telling you, if ever a nation was marked by God, with the Holy Ghost and with Israel, and uh, He's got them available online. When I was in Israel in May, this article came out. Now I um, I didn't, hadn't known this. A couple of weeks ago, well, I want to tell you first that God used Australia. Australia and the Aussies are the ones that got Jerusalem freed when the Crusaders couldn't, when Napoleon couldn't, when nobody could do it. Not even the English could do it. And they were, and, and uh, Turkey, the Ottoman Turks, who had held that part of the world for years, was allied with uh, Germany. 
And so England was coming up the south. They figured the best way to do was come up the south from the desert. They came up by the ancient wells of Beersheba. They had 60,000 men and horses that were just about to die from lack of water. And the English were ready to give up when Chauvel, quite a man, I've got, no, I don't have a picture of him here, but uh, quite a man, uh, he's a commander of the Aussies. The Aussies were the newest nation on earth. They only had been formed in 1901. This was 1917. And uh, a bunch of boys who had, most of them lied about their ages. You know, Australia, it's a huge country, but everybody lives near the water. The, the middle part, just kangaroos and crocodile Dundee, and Steve lived there. <laughs> and they've got these horses, wild horses. So uh, a bunch of these boys, they captured those horses. They captured them years before. They knew their horses. They were just one with their horse. They volunteered to go and to help. So Australia went, having joined in England, with England to come and help. And the Aussies, it's so funny. I went to, got a book from the War Museum. And the English, you know, they're so proper. And they had riding school. And you had to ride, you had to mount correctly. And you had to do one, two, three, four. Everything just right. <laughs> and ride properly. So the Aussies, you know, they, were, they had these slouch hats. They had a big emu feather. And when they asked them what it was, they told them it was a kangaroo feather. <laughs> these guys are like the old west guys. So the English, they had the riding school, and they said, now we'll see what the Aussies can do. Had them all lined up. How many of you can ride step forward? Not a one step forward. How many of you have ever been on a horse? They all step forward. Mount. They said, such a sight you've never seen. Most of them went over the rears of their horses, jumped up over, bottoms up. They were one with their horses. So they came to the place where they were going to die if they didn't get water. And Colonel Chevelle said that the, the, um, the, the Ottomans, the Turks, under, under German generals and leadership, were dug in and they had their guns in a trench. Chevelle said, we'll leap the trench to get to water. The ancient wells of Abraham at Beersheba. They said, it's a death thing. You'll be dead. You'll all be dead. There were 800 of them. I said, we'll do it. They gave the charge, and they leaped those trenches. One man told Cole Stringer, he said, they gave me a reward, but he said they shouldn't have done it. When my horse smelled water, all I could do was hang on. <laughs> <laughs> and those bush horses were better adam adapted to turned out to be adapted so well to the desert, better than camels even. And they leaped those trenches. They lost only 32 men. And w here's a point, one of the points I wanted to get over to you. When they did that, the Ottoman Turks in the trenches stood and applauded. <laughs> That's how they'll do when God shows out. When I was in, Austra when I was in uh, Israel in May, this came in the newspaper written by a man named Rubenstein. And he gave a secret that happened in World War, uh, excuse me, in, in the recent Iraqi war. A couple of weeks ago, U.S. President George W. Bush revealed something surprising about the beginning of the Iraq war. It did not begin with the much-talked-about decapitation strike on a Baghdad meeting, including Saddam and his sons, on March 19, as wildly believed. The first shots were actually fired earlier. And those doing the firing were not Americans or even their British allies. They were Special Air Services SAS forces from the third military partner in the coalition, Australia. And now... Recent revelations about the until now secret activity of the Australian forces make it clear that more than anything else, it was the Australians who made it impossible for Saddam to fire Scud missiles at Israel as he had done in 1991. 
According to the Chief of Staff of Australia's Special Operations Forces, Colonel John Mansell, hundreds of SAS soldiers in Land Rovers and dropped in by helicopter penetrated into western Iraq a full 36 hours before the bombing of Baghdad began. They breached guard posts. They stopped convoys. They moved to the missile sites. They took them out. They, uh, they captured ships, Iraqi tugs that were carrying uh, mines about to be released into the water against the coalition's ships. Didn't you always wonder why you didn't hear anything from Saddam? It's because they'd taken them out. Now here's what Mike told us up at the north. He said, you know how you implanted reporters? You implanted them where you wanted them. It was a part of military strategy. And they were all over there planted with the Americans and the British while the Aussies were taking out all the hardware in the western desert and nobody knew it. Now, but this is what's thrilling. Listen, listen, listen. The guy tells about World War I. Uh, through Vichy, Syria, they were about to move on the Jews. The Nazis were in World War II and the Aussies took them out. And he said, the Australian forces again at the forefront. Uh, but, but this is the last paragraph I want you to get. Despite the distances involved and the apparent lack of overlapping interest, there seems to be a sort of, milita- a sort of affinity between Australia and Israel, almost an overlapping destiny. Australia was named Australia, the land, south land of the Holy Ghost, on Pentecost Sunday, May 14, 1606. They were tied to the outpouring of the Holy Ghost. They were tied to the birth of Israel with the May 14th date. And God, I love watching God. I love watching Him. He didn't just act back in the Old Testament. Dear God, He's doing things now that are even farther and greater and bigger and and more shocking. Now, men have to work with God. He always wants us to work with him. Nations have to work with God. God has a plan. This book is a plan. Jerry Savell said they call us word people. They ought to call us favorite word people. We pick us out a few scriptures and camp on them. How many people in this room have been born again more than 10 years stand up? Now look around you, or look up there. We're not a baby church. And this church right here, I don't know how many of you are from here, is a well-taught church. But not all of them are. I got a call from, no, I called him, and then we talked a long time, Brother um, Hilton Sutton. He was weeping. He said, Billy, it's pitiful how little... Some pastors know. And here we are in the middle of it, and it's on them. So bless the Lord. You may be seated. Hallelujah. By the time you're 10 years old in the Lord, you should at least know there's a plan in this book. And it starts in Genesis and ends in Revelation. You should know something about it, and you should know where you fit. Hallelujah. Now, nations wouldn't get in the predicaments they've gotten in if they would have known this plan and worked with it. And I'm going to speak to you right now about the end of this is, in case I don't get to the end. (laughs) The end of this is pray for your leaders. Pray for President Bush. Pray that God would give them the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him. Pray for the State Department that either they would flow with the plan of God or they would be removed. That's a fair prayer. I could pray that for every pastor. That he'd flow with the plan of God or be removed. That's not a mean prayer. It's safe here. This pastor definitely flows with God's plan at the front of it. Now... I have learned something by revelation, by God's showing me, that I want to show you now that I've seen 
I can't always get this over to people. I try to show them. They don't always get it. If there's a prayer that any group will get it, it's you. If you don't get it, I'll never preach in it again. <laughs> in 19... Because there's no other group quite like you, really. Uh, no other church quite like you. And um, there could be. There should be. You're very blessed if you come here to church. In 1997, I took with Jim Caseman an AFCM tour to Israel. And so we're coming up the coast from Ben Gurion Airport, going up the way of the sea. Uh, and we go through a town named Herzliya. And there's a great big water tower with Herzl's picture on it. Uh, and the town, of course, as you can guess, if you'll show number 89, this is uh, Theodore Herzl. And, of course, the town of uh, 89, number 89. The town of Herzliya is named for him, and they have him. We're going to get this for sure. Are you there? <laughs> Number eight, nine. Maybe it has to take time to come up. Computers. How are we doing? The computer is locked up. I just bind the devil. You are not going to be working on our computer. You are not any little devils. I just bind you and demand you get out of there. Hallelujah. Bless the Lord. But anyway, I'm coming through Herzliya, and there's a water tower. And on that water tower is Theodore Herzl's picture and it says 1897 to 1997, 100 years. And so I'm looking up there at it, and it says, and God says, I want you to remember that 100 years. So I said, okay, I remember it. It's 100 years since the first Zionist Congress. This is something good to remember. So uh, I went on. We had our tour through Israel. We went to Europe. We went to part of our tour to uh, Europe was Austria. And uh, there the devil tried to kill us from freezing us to death. Uh, but it didn't work. We went to preach at this. Uh, they were so good to us. And they put us up in a chalet in the mountain, Shelley and I. And um, they said, now tomorrow morning you can get up and you'll have a breakfast down at the house of the lady who runs this chalet. And it's just so nice. And it was. It was beautiful. It was just picturesque. But I noticed about nightfall the temperature dropping. And I went over to all the heat things and turned them all, and it did nothing. And it dropped, and it dropped, and it dropped, and I've never been so cold in all of my life. It was absolutely bone-chilling. Shelly and I got every bit of the clothes we had in our suitcases and put them all on. Every <laughs> item of clothes that we could stick on us, we stuck on us. This is a bad thing to tell, but we even took our underwear, every pair of it, <laughs> and put on our heads. We got it. Number 89. There he is, Theodore Herzl. Woo! This man, a giant of a man, probably stood about six foot seven. And there was his, uh, his uh, picture. God said 1897 to 1997. So we go to this place, and the next morning we thought, oh, we're going down. The heat starts coming on. We find out the lady saving money. She turns it down. So, we, oh, we got to go down. We got to get some oatmeal, something hot. We can't get out of the house. They have locked it. They have some kind of a lock from the outside. <laughs> so when the pastor comes to get us from church, we're peering out the windows to get escaped. <laughs> it's really nothing. But I'm just telling you all this to say that sometimes on trips you have to be a trooper. <laughs> And we had trooped and trooped on this trip. <laughs> and we're headed to go to Germany. And uh, the pastors, Alan Gloria Veer, they said, we want you to come to Germany and teach about Israel's place. 
in Bible prophecy. And we feel that we should tell you that we have never mentioned it once to our people. So you don't know if they're going to like Israel's place, not like Israel's place. Their grandpa was a Nazi. You don't know what's going to face. So I'm kind of going in like that. And then Steve Morin says there's a surprise for you. And we didn't stop in Germany. We stopped in Basel, Switzerland. He said, there's a lady, and I knew the lady well, a dear lady, in, uh, a well-to-do lady in uh, Canada. And she wants to treat your bodies. She has arranged for you to stay in a very expensive hotel. Oh, brother, we were so glad. <laughs> we drove up in front of this um, this, it was called the Three Kings, an old hotel right on the Rhine River. And we got in those fluffy beds and robes and shoes. And Shelly and I just pranced around in there. <laughs> and uh, we went to the meetings. The meetings were great. The people were great. Even a Muslim got saved one night. And I came home higher than a kite. Well, Shelly knows me. You know, we're a spirit. We have a soul. We live in a body. If your spirit gets an ascendancy, well, I don't know about yours, but here's mine. If my spirit gets in a sentence, I don't sleep. I can't sleep because my spirit doesn't need to sleep. It's like God. So Shelly knows if she doesn't get my spirit down, I'm not going to sleep and she's not going to sleep. <laughs> so she says to me, Mom, here's a book on this hotel. She knows that if I read something dull, I will come down. I'm not really one of those that can listen to Scripture and go to bed. I can listen to Scripture, but I don't go to sleep. So she says, here, Mom, read this book. So I started reading the book. And when I was reading the book, there was this picture in the book 103. Number 103. One, there it is. This is Theodore Herzl, and this is the most famous picture of him ever. And Theodore Herzl was it said in the book, this hotel is the hotel where Theodore Herzl came and stayed during the first Zionist convention in 1897. Now I've heard an audible voice told me on the same trip at the beginning to remember 1897 to 1997, 100 years. And here it says it was in this hotel. I said, Shelley! Oh dear me, look at what's happened. And I can tell you most of the leading of God in my life is unconscious leading. It's not that I'm so bright to know to follow the Lord. It's just like I stumble upon things. <laughs> Shelly, Shelly, this is the room. You just think of it. He was right in this hotel. God was bringing about the biggest miracle of all times. He's going to bring the Jews back just like he said he would. And it started, the European thing started right at this hotel. And we're in it. And God put us here. So I said, oh, no. <laughs> Could it have waited a week till we rested? I said, well, now tomorrow we've got to get to this room where he was. And Shelly said, okay, Mom, tomorrow, tomorrow. We'll do it tomorrow. And um, so I... Uh, I waited, the, I didn't wait, I stayed awake all night. I called Steve Moran the next day and I said to him, I have got to get in that room where Herzl stayed. And uh, so he called a lady, a Swiss lady, and he said, they called the hotel and they said, we can't let you in the room where Herzl stayed, but we'll let you in the room right in the next where Herzl stayed. And so I said, okay. And so we went to the next room and can you get a picture, can you get a shot of this because I don't have it on my PowerPoint. But I posed to take a picture in the same pose that Herzl was in. <laughs> now as I posed, I don't know if I can get this or not. Probably cannot. Can you get your camera in on this? How are you doing it? Well, I posed in the same place. Yeah, can you see it kind of? I'll hold it there, close. Now, as we took the picture, Steve Morin screamed. Now, we're on the next room to Herzl. 
If you will notice, in Herzl's picture, there is a tram on the bridge. Exactly when we snap the picture, there's a tram on the bridge. If I had been on the next balcony, Herzl's balcony, it would have been exactly at the same place. So you can imagine with all this audible voices, to me audible, maybe not to you, strange happenings, Theodore Herzl became a very interesting figure in my life. I came home and I tried finding out every single thing I could about Theodore Herzl since the Lord had tied me to him. I went to the local library and I found a book. Now, most people think that Herzl was secular and uh, he, he was like many Jews. I think you scratch them down there deep and they're not really so secular. They keep Passover, they keep Yom Kippur. Uh, they keep open to God. But Herzl, when he was 12 years old, was preparing for his bar mitzvah. Someone gave him a book on the King Messiah. The King Messiah coming on a white horse, as the scriptures say. He began to realize that if the Jews came back home, like when they came out of Egypt, there would need to be a Moses-type leader, a Moses-type figure. And so he thought about that, and he went to bed, and he had a dream. The King Messiah came, a glorious and majestic old man, took me in his arms and swept off with me on the wings of the wind. On one of the iridescent clouds, we encountered the figure of Moses. The features were familiar to me out of my childhood in the statue by Michelangelo. The Messiah called to Moses, It is for this child that I have prayed. You know where those words come from? Hannah's prayer. Hannah's rejoicing. So the Messiah said to Moses, It was for this child that I have prayed. But to me, he said, To the child Theodore Herzl, Go, declare to the Jews that I shall come soon and perform great wonders and great deeds for my people and for the whole world. So he had that dream. And he grew up and he became a very, very famous man. He became a journalist, well-read, well-written, even a bit secular. But he was in Europe at a time of great, great persecution of the Jews. The czars were having the pogroms that were slaughtering Jews. All of Europe had a crest. It was riding a crest of anti-Semitism as it is right now. And in France there was a man named Alfred Dreyfus who was a military captain and uh, the French railroaded him in a court that caught the attention of the European world and blamed him, and prosecuted him, and banished him for something he did not know, do, and everyone knew it was because he was a Jew. It was a plot. Later on, it became known that it was indeed an anti-Semitic plot, and he was released. But when he saw this, when uh, Herzl saw this, he became very, very concerned about his people, concerned about what to do. You know, Ronnie Levy said to me one time, and... Of course, you know Ronnie and his little children. We love them so much. And he said, Billy, my oldest daughter, he said, what do I tell her? She says to me, Daddy, why do they hate us just because we're Jews? How do you, what if you had to tell your child that? What if you had to explain something to him or to her like that? And so Theodore Herzl uh, began seeking, I don't know if he'd call it seeking God, but he actually began thinking about all these things and thinking about what God wanted, or what was going to happen. And he sat for a, uh, he sat for a, a, a bust to be made of him. And as he was sitting for that bust to be made of him, something began happening like a plan dropping down upon him. I guess you have some time if you're sitting for a bust. 
And uh, if you will give me number 92, someone sent me Theodore Herzl's an old, old, old book that had contained some of his diary. Wasn't that a blessing to get? And uh, in this, he explained about how this dropped on him a plan. And uh, in this paragraph right here, I shall read to you from it. It says, With the swiftness of a dream rose the plan for this work. I had scarcely gone the distance from one street to the next, and it was complete in my mind. He'd walked out of where he was sitting, and within a block or so, the whole thing was complete. The next day I sat down, three wonderful weeks of excitement and work. I thought that through this dramatic eruption I should write myself free. On the contrary, I was drawn in deeper and deeper. The thought grew ever stronger that I had to do something for the Jews. Uh, I wrote, then he said, the answer he received was, Emigration is the only answer if enough land can be bought. Going back to the Holy Land, the plan came to him. I wrote... Walking, standing, lying down on the street, at table, by night, when I was driven forth from my sleep. Every note bears its date. I no longer have time to copy the notes. I've begun the second book so as to put down daily what is worth putting down. And thus the notes accumulate. He speaks of cities and streets and, 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 and uniting the Zionists and everything came to him. He saw an army. He saw uh, plantations. He saw crops. He saw creations of means, and I'm not finding it right now, but I shall find it for you in a minute. He heard the sound of wings all the time when he was writing. It reminded me of um, Hallelujah Chorus. What's his name? Handel. He went into a room for three weeks and came out with this, with this uh, music, and it was tear-stained, and God had given it to him. The same three weeks came to Theodore Herzl, and Theodore Herzl wrote those things, and he put them in a book called Der, Der Judenstadt, The Jewish State. And he put the book out for sale. And he tried to sell the idea to wealthy Jews. He tried to so, sell the idea to religious Jews. Uh, most of them took a standoff uh, approach to it. Some of them were openly against it. And he came to the place, um, if you will give me number 93. Uh, I believe it's number 93. This is Herzl's father. And he has this diary entry on uh, February 4th, 1896. My good father is my only support. All those with whom I have taken counsel till now are holding back cautiously waiting. Near me I feel this dear old man. He stands like a tree. That was Mar February 4th. On March 10th, the Reverend William Heschler, chaplain of the English embassy here, came to see me. This is his diary, Herzl's diary. A sympathetic, gentle fellow with a long gray beard of a prophet. He is enthusiastic about my solution of the Jewish question. He also considers my movement a prophetic turning point, which he had foretold two years before from a prophecy, if you will show now number, um, number 90, Four, number 94. This is William Heschler, and these are the pages. He said, and I'm reading again from the prophecy. Oh, this is, thrills me. This is from the diary of Herzl. Got it? And Herzl says that Heschler comes in and tells him that from a prophecy in the time of Omar, 637 CE, Omar's the one that built the Dome of the Rock in 37, 637. So when the Dome of the Rock was built over the rock, the rock where Abraham offered up Isaac, the rock which was the temple, and to tell you the real truth, and this is something I don't often tell folks, it might scare them, fall them off their seats. But from the ancient uh, books I've studied about the temple of God, it's built with its parts corresponding to a human body because it was God's first will that he indwell the human body and that the human became the temple of God. And the first man, Adam, was made from the dust off the temple mount. Then the Bible says God planted a garden eastward in Eden and put him there. 
So God's plan, it's kind of a secondary plan to have a temple on the hill. First plan, man defiled his body. And I'm telling you folks, there's something being about being the temple of the Holy Ghost and not defiling your body. You don't defile. I wish we had the sense of the Jews for the holy sanctity of the temple. You wouldn't have to preach on things that we have to. So you didn't fall off your chair. We're going right along. <laughs> In the year that Omar, out of Baghdad, Baghdad had become the head of the Muslim world. The Omar, out of Baghdad, put a rock, a dome over that rock. In that year came forth a prophecy. William Heschler, the Anglican, Anglican preacher that I'm talking to you about, got a hold of that prophecy. And he reckoned from it that at the end of 42 prophetic months, totaling 1,260 years, the Jews would get Palestine back. And the figure he arrived at was 1897 and 1898. See, God's been giving prophecies down through the years. Bless the Lord. This is, this is Heckler, uh, excuse me, this is Herzl. When he read my book, he ran at once to Ambassador Monsoon and said, The prophesied movement is here. Now I'm going to read you from a book called The Prince and the Prophet, which is no longer in print. We wish it were. We may bring it back. But we know that only dedicated readers would read it. I don't know if you know me very well. You remember that Shulamit Katz Nelson said to me once, didn't you know that no Jew ever did anything for the rebirth of Israel without a dedicated Christian called alongside to help? She was talking about this Heschler. I didn't know about him then. Now here is what Heschler wrote that he said. Dr. Herzl, when he burst in, Heschler entered the office. Herzl had no time to note the great nobility of his visitor's face, who began to speak immediately in an enthusiastic tone, being obviously moved. Dr. Herzl, I've been waiting for you four years. Four years I've been announcing you to princes, statesmen, and ecclesiastical dignitaries whom I met. I prepared the way for you. The hour has rung, and your idea will succeed. Consider me as being at your service, at the service of our cause. But just who are you, sir? Herzl interrupted. The British clergyman, under emotion, had failed to follow the most basic English custom of all. He hadn't introduced himself. <laughs> this done, the two men got to know each other. The Grand Duke of Baden was soon evoked, as well as the work of Heschler, which fixed 1897 as the fateful year of the Zionist idea. Quote, from this is Heschler's words. Your book is inspired, Dr. Herzl, in a way you yourself do not realize, and that's good. This is a sign of the very grace of God. For just like everybody else, including every Jew in this capital, this is Vienna, you have forgotten your prophets. You don't give them credit anymore. But you belong to your people and your prophets, and this, combined with the suffering of Israel, will not let you rest. Like Moses in the past, it is your people's martyrdom, both in Russia and in the features of a French captain, which now brings you back to God and toward the forgotten Jerusalem. I tell you that with emotion, and I will always repeat it. God is with you, and you will succeed, come what may. He had, gotten, he had seen Herzl's book in a bookstore, and he bought it. Herzl was to note in his short autobiography... I don't remember ever writing anything in such a state of exaltation. Now he's talking about when he wrote the plan for the Jewish state. Herzl tells us that he heard a noise of wings when he composed certain stanzas. I too heard them when I composed this book, working each day to exhaustion. The man that wrote The Prince and the Prophet. Now, Heschler, he was an English clergyman, but an Anglican. And he had applied for the position to go to Jerusalem and been turned down and sent to Vienna instead. He happened to be very well placed with the leaders of the world. They liked him. He was a teacher. He taught their students. Among his students were the children of the Grand Duke of Baden. This is his picture, number 95. 
which tells the story of it. And number 96. The Grand Duke of Baden was the uh, uncle of Kaiser Willem. Kaiser Willem is the head of a superpower. The superpower being Germany. The world had different superpowers then. And Heschler was well placed. He had entry. He had doors to the superpowers. One of his main doors was this Grand Duke of Baden who loved him dearly, believed everything he said, and was the Kaiser's uncle. And so on that day that he burst into Herzl's office, he tells him that he knows the superpowers of the world. And this is, these are the words of Heschler to the Grand Duke of Baden. All that this remarkable movement now requires is the public recognition and protection of the sovereigns of Europe. Is this not now possible after the question has been so earnestly taken up by the Jews themselves? But some of the rich, unbelieving Jews are still holding back. However, I'm sure they will also join as soon as the Jewish state is successful, which it must be according to the Bible, for the Jews are then to be a blessing to all the nations. If I could, I should go quite quietly to every European sovereign and plead for God's ancient people begging that the land of promise might be given back to the Jews to whom God gave it for an everlasting possession some 4,000 years ago. May I venture to beg your royal highness to say a few kind words to his majesty the Tsar on this subject in case you should see him at Darmstadt. If I could only persuade everyone to read Dr. Herzl's Judenstadt and see how wonderfully it agrees with the Bible prophecies and he wrote it without even knowing it himself. Thanks to William Heschler, the Zionist leader's name and movement became known. Essentially through the audience granted by Frederick of Baden, echoes of which had somehow reached all the royal courts of Europe and their representative governments. Since the destruction of the temple by the Roman legions, no Jew had ever approached the princes and powerful ones of the world with such a bold and clear call and language so similar to that of Moses, permit my people to leave to go to the land of their fathers. He reached and had audience, many audiences with every superpower of the time. And in the times that this was happening, they went together. Herzl would give the plan that God had given him. Heschler would take the Bible and say how God had said this would happen. All of these superpower leaders purported to be Christians. Even the Tsar, who was terribly treating the Jews. They had audience after audience with Wilhelm of Germany. They even met him in Israel. They took a trip down there. It's a famous picture. I don't happen to have it up here of, 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 the, of Kaiser Wilhelm. And, and, and Theodore Herzl standing by the horse almost as tall as a horse. And of them meeting the superpowers of the earth. They had an audience with the Tsar Nicholas. And they were working through once of the princes, number 165. He was the head of the superpower of Russia. One six, uh, two, uh, excuse me, 101. Give me 101. And 102 is a closer up view of the Tsar Nicholas. They had audience with him. Audience with Kaiser Willem, number 100. See Kaiser Willem, many audiences with Kaiser Willem. Uh, number 98, the Sultan of Turkey. The Ottoman Turks were the superpowers of the day. They had audience with Prince Ferdinand of Bulgaria and Grand Duke Vladimir. Every single one of the superpowers they had audience with. And every single one of the superpowers were told, this is the plan of Jehovah. This is the plan of God. Here it is in the book, given by Heschler, who knew exactly what it was. And they all admired Heschler. Then here, the book that's not in print anymore is called The Prince and the Prophet. The prophet being Heschler, the prince being Herzl. And then the Herzl would give them the plan that God had given him, how it could work. 
Every single one of the superpowers turned it down. For various reasons, they mulled it over, they talked it over, they decided not to do it, not to back it. In 1897, Heschler said to Herzl, just do it on your own. Go and have a Congress and declare it a nation, a state. That very day that I was in, in um, Sweden, in Switzerland, in Basel, and I found the room where he was, and I said, well, we've got to find the Congress Hall. And we searched to find the Congress Hall, and we found it. And they were preparing for a symphony orchestra that day. And it didn't seem that anybody was paying attention to what had really big happened in this Congress Hall. And I said, is this the place where they founded the modern-day state of Israel? They said, yes, there's a plaque on the wall. There was a bronze plaque over there. I went over there in two languages, in German, Swiss German, and in Hebrew. It said, this is the room where we founded the modern state of Israel. And I could read it in Hebrew. And the fact that I could read it in Hebrew just made me cry and cry and cry. Because I knew that God had arranged my life, got me there that day, not only got me there that day, got me so I could read the sign. That was the hardest part. Now, they turned down the plan. As I've seen all this, I realized we didn't have to have World War I. Every single one of those superpowers lost their kingdoms. None of them have them today. We didn't have to have World War II. It grew out of World War I. Now, I want to show you what the Kaiser was busying himself with, too busy to go with the plan of God. Turn with me to the book of Revelation. Are you getting any of this? Are you seeing how important it is that the United States of America goes with the plan of God and we have to pray that they do it if we never get off our knees? They call James the brother of Jesus old camel knees because he never got hardly off of his knees. Whatever we have to do, we'll do it. Revelation chapter 2. And I believe out of this conference can come forth an army praying for our leaders. I, I like to have a president that reads the Bible. I like to have an attorney general that prays in the Holy Ghost. We must pray that they go with the plan of God. Revelation chapter 2 and verse 12. Now remember Jesus is coming to visit the seven churches of Asia. Remember this is John who has seen this. Verse 12, and to the angel of the church in Pergamos, or Pergamon, write, These things saith he which hath the sharp sword with two edges. I know thy works and where thou dwellest, where Satan's seat is. And thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith, even in the days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr who was slain among you where Satan dwells. Now, in Hebrew, and I've asked Rick Renner, and it's true in Greek as well, the word seat and the word throne are the same word. So this indicates to us that Satan has enthroned himself in this Turkish city of today, Turkey, Pergamon. And that he, actually the Greek says, sits there where Satan sits. If you are, in, in Hebrew, that word dwell is you sit someplace. So he's seated there, that's his seat, that's his throne, and Jesus talks about this as being his place of operation at that time. I want to show you, uh, I need a, a map to my books here. Uh, I would like to show you this Pergamon um, altar in situation in the time of Jesus. This is a drawing of it, number 11. Number 11. Uh, in those Greek cities of that day, and this was a Greek city in what's now Turkey, uh, the, the, there would be a, a necropolis, a hill at the top, and that's where they thought the gods lived, and then the people would live down below, and they would have temples to the gods above. Now this is a huge area, a huge place, and here is this Pergamon altar 
that we are going to discuss right now. At the same time that Herzl and Heschler were trying to get the attention of the Kaiser Willem, a discovery was made in Turkey by a German road crew. They were going to build a road from Turkey. Uh, it was a big project they were having, and they stumbled upon uh, that that I just showed you. They stumbled upon it underground, and they stumbled upon the altar. Now, the Kaiser was trying to build a superpower to rival Britain. Britain had a lot of uh, archives and things they'd kept, they, they had taken from Egypt. So the Germans were in uh, a, an alliance with Turkey, and he got the right from the Ottoman Turks to dig this place. And there he found the Pergamon altar that was an altar to Zeus, that was a place that had a counterfeit Ark of the Covenant that Jesus called the seat of Satan. They found it down there, and they started excavating it. They started digging it, and they brought it piece by piece. The Kaiser would go down there and piece by piece help bring this huge place back to Berlin, which he was building as a capital. It is now in Berlin. We went there this summer to see it. It's absolutely humongous. This is it in Berlin now. They had to build a big uh, museum around it, number eight. You will see number eight, the Pergamon altar. It's absolutely huge. And they built only the front part of it. They didn't build all the back part of it. You can walk into a room to get an idea of the size. We are on the steps here in number nine. This is, this is us on the steps right here. And you walk up this huge place and you go into the side where the uh, sacrifices were made. He had to build a huge museum to house it. And they brought it there piece by piece. He, rather than going with the plan of God, was get, getting what Jesus called the seat of Satan to bring it to Germany. I don't know that he knew what he was doing. But I think he was definitely moved upon by Satan not to go with the plan of God. Uh, not only did he get the Pergamon altar and bring it, he went to Babylon and got the Ishtar Gates. Now the Ishtar Gates, number 13, uh, at the same museum, you can go in and see the Pergamon altar, and you can see these are absolutely beautiful, by the way, big blue baked tiles. There are no uh, rocks on that plain where they built the Tower of Babel, so they have to have bricks, and these are tiled, beautiful blue tiled bricks. Uh, this is one of the gates, the smaller gate, and they have it right there reconstructed in this huge uh, museum. Uh, there was a processional way to this, number 14, and Daniel would have walked down this processional way. And the processional way to the gates are, are on the side uh, lions. Here's a close-up of one of the lions in detail, 15. You will indeed see that it is a lion with eagle's wings. Remember, this is what Daniel saw as Babylon. He saw it as a lion with eagle's wings. Now Babylon was never destroyed, ever destroyed in the time of... People think that, that's a, a, that, that um, Babylonian chapters 50 and 51 of Jeremiah, chapter 13 of Isaiah happened. It never happened. It was never destroyed. Uh, and you can see here how they found these gates in uh, 16, in situation. And you can see that they were practically... They were just standing there. They hadn't been destroyed. Uh, Model A shows you how they would have been, uh, and this is number 19. This shows you how they would have been uh, in the days of Daniel. You walked down this processional way through the smaller gate, which is now erected. They have the larger gate, but they don't have it erected. It's too big to do. And uh, number uh, 20 is another site of this. This is how it would have been back in the days of Nebuchadnezzar I. And these led out, the gates led out to the Euphrates River. Uh, but here is the thing. Now, it's so interesting with the Pergamon altar as it played its uh, part in history. It is the place, it was in, of course, Berlin, brought to Berlin. It was there during World War I. It was there during World War II. Hitler worshipped at it. If you have ever seen Hitler when he has all the swastikas, marching in a great sports field, and, and, and they're doing all this uh, 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 occultish marching. 
He had a great sports field built, and he had it patterned after the Port of Pergamon altar. I found this just on a website, just as a matter of architectural interest. Nobody trying to prove anything. He just patterned it after this. And he made his speeches from what was the Pergamon altar that Jesus called the seat of Satan. He made his speeches from that place. Now, during World War II, at the end of World War II, Patton was making his move, and the United States was moving toward Nazis. But we backed off and let Russia come in because Russia had been besieged by the Nazis in Leningrad. So when they came in, it made, uh, it made Berlin a divided city. How many of you can remember the Berlin Wall? And the Berlin Wall went down in the middle of that city, and the Berlin Wall divided it between East and West Berlin. We had West Berlin, which was free. East Berlin was communist. The wall made the Pergamon altar over into the communist sector. So all during the days of the communist reign, communism out of Russia, communism out of uh, Germany, that was in the communist side of things. That wall made the Pergamon altar over in the communist side. Today, the European Union is German and French driven and now this Pergamon altar is in the, uh, the, the area of the European Union. Very many interesting things about the Pergamon altar. All that I'm saying to you is this and I've never been able to get this over to anybody. I don't know if we got it over to you or not. But I'm telling you God was working and God gave a man a plan. He always gives men plans. He had said, his word said, I'm going to bring the Jews home. I'm going to give them their place. Now I'll just give you this little thought to think about. I'm leaving, so you can't stone me. <laughs> if all the Jews had come into the church, God couldn't have kept his word. He could not have brought them home. He kept them as a group and brought them home just like he said he would. And the gifts and callings of God in Romans 11 are talking about them. And they're going to, you read your Bible, they're going to be established back in earthly Jerusalem. It's going to come up like a mountain high out of the hill. All the nations, the sheep nations are going to come to them to find out about God. Because the gifts and the callings of God, it was the job of Israel to reveal him to the nations. Now there is a plan. Today there is a plan. We have different superpowers. We have different superpowers because all of those superpowers blew it. Wouldn't it have been great not to have World War I and World War II? Wouldn't it have been great if they just said, we see it. I'll go with it. I'll back it. So bless the Lord. Now, we've got different superpowers. We've got the same God. We've got the same plan. You're still going to be a sheep nation or a goat nation based on the same word and the same scriptures. And I believe, God, that the United States leadership is going to see this. We're going to repent of anything we've done wrong. I believe our leaders will repent if they need to repent. They may have done it last night for all I know. But we're going to hold on. We're not going to let this nation not be a sheep nation. And we're not going to let our good men go. But I tell you folks, if there had been somebody praying for the Kaiser, if there had been somebody who really knew what they were doing praying, I believe that man could have made the right decision. And all of history changed. Men have wills and nations have wills. But I'll tell you something. I'm going to put it on the doorstep of the preachers. Oh, that's not my thing. I hear that all the time. I hear it all the time. It's not my thing. I don't preach about things like that. I would to God George Bush's pastor taught about things like that. I would to God Clinton's pastor would have taught about things like that. You might have a little boy in your church, a little girl, who's going to go up and be Condoleezza Rice. And they need to know God's plan. And not be ashamed of it. Well, praise the Lord, we got some time left here. And I believe we can ask God to forgive us. And not like I'm joining Brother Hilton Sutton. He's weeping over our churches, our pastors, our people knowing. And I believe God's going to give us great revelation. And we're going to move in the plan of God and affect the people we need to. 
because these things are every bit as big as Mark eleven twenty three. I love Mark eleven twenty three. I can be in the ministry because of it. Bless the Lord. I can go and not be afraid and have what I say. But I'm telling you right now, we need to know what God's doing in the earth and influence people to go with His plan no matter what. No matter where the ch- let the chips fall where they may. Bless the Lord. Hallelujah. Pastor. Hallelujah. Y'all let Billy know how much you appreciate what 